Today we're going to talk about some uh, of the prayers of Rosh Hashanah and outside influences in the Tefillot. And that is, on Rosh Hashanah it's, it's particularly evident, but we have outside influences in other places because Sidurim were printed and before they were printed they were copied and people added their own prayers. And sometimes there were outside movements that broke away from Judaism uh, they had their own prayers and somehow they found their ways into the Sidur, most significantly the Shabbatai Tzvi, the false Mashiach, and, and his followers that believed them, that he was the Mashiach, Mashiach always, already came, so they changed a lot of the, the, the Tzfilot, especially since a lot of his followers were great rabbis, Kabbalists who believed in him. Later on, they sort of repented, but some of them, we don't know that... Uh, wholeheartedly repented, and it was Rabbi only was superficially. No, Rabbi Ben Amozeg was a very logical, rational person. He was against against all that, but he was uh, accused in heresy because it was too philosophical and too logical, and it's way after it. But in, it was so, uh, the campaign against him was so bad this 19th century that in, in Syria, the, some rabbis burned his books. We, who were the rabbis from Morocco? The rabbis no, from, the, from Morocco, not that many, but it was mainly in Europe. In so Europe, in it, 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 it spread eventually. It was spread eventually, but when the, when the movement... We have been give up today. Yeah, eventually it spread, but at the moment when, he, when the movement started, it mainly affected the Ottoman Empire, Turkey and Eretz Israel, but there were rabbis like in Hamir Hayun and uh, even Rabbi Moshe Hagiz, uh, and others, Rabbi uh, Ratan in, uh, in Germany, was accused of being a follower of Shabbat It had a very, and, uh, it had a very, very deep roots. And we'll see that what, there's one book called Hemdat Yamim that uh, is an anthology of prayers that probably was written by one of the followers of Shabbat Tzvi. According to my uh, great grandfather, Hacham Daftaya, it was Natana Azati who was the uh, immediate disciple of Shabtai Tzvi and his manager, so to speak, who wrote the book, and he wrote it as purposefully to promote the agenda of Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, but we don't know for sure. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. A lot of was written about this. But one thing is for sure: when you read the prayers in the book Hamdat Yamim and those which made their way into our Sidur, they have weird concepts. Even when you speak about Kabbalah, things that don't belong in it's. Preferable not to say those tefillot. I'm not sure. We're not sure about the mizmor of the parnasa if it's from the same source, but uh, we'll go one by one. So the first uh, interesting addition to the tefillah is what we call tefillah ala parnasa. We open the ark, the echal, after the tefillot, uh, usually min arvit and, and, and musaf. We read Psalm 24, the David mizmor la Adonai aretz umla tevel v'yoshveba. Which obviously conveys the idea that, that God takes care of the world. He's the creator. He could provide for all. Beautiful. Then we say, Yiratzon. Yiratzon, we pray that... And, and that prayer is beautiful. Let's just uh, read the translation. May your divine uh, will proceed from before you to what? Uh, to inscribe us in the book of livelihood and provisions this year and every single year. We with all our members of our household, etc., etc. That we will be... From give us from your generously open hand, beautiful, beautiful tefillah. The problem is with this insertion in the in the middle. We say, do uh, for your sake, good, and for the sake of the sanctity of this sacred psalm, psalm, still good, and for the uh, the sake of the sacred names that are mentioned in it, verses, words. Letters, hints, and secrets. So all this still is a very common formula when you speak about, we know when the Kabbalists write about the mystical ideas in, in, that we do not understand. But then <coughs> we have this added element which is unique for this prayer. And for the sake of the great and sacred name that emerges from the verse, Varikoti lachem berchaat belidai, they took pesukim that speak about blessing and, and, uh, and Hashem shining His countenance over, over us. And it says that there's, an, there's a great and holy name that comes out of these verses. Already Rabbi Mosh, uh, Yosef Meshash in Utsara Mikhtavim speaks about that. He says, there's, we have no such traditions of praying to a name. 
he says, I don't understand what is the meaning of for the sake of the name. What is this name? Is it an angel? If it's an angel, we don't pray to angel. If it's God, we have the direct name of God. Yud Kevavke, this is the name that we know. It's not mentioned in the Tanakh, it's not mentioned in the, not even in Kabbalistic writings, it's not mentioned in the list, in the Talmud of the, the, the holy names which cannot be erased. He says, just skip those whole thing. What about uh, That's a different story. Like, um, it's a combination of letters, but still, you say the verses, you don't say for the sake of the names that come out of, of here. It's very clear you say that. Uh, scholars later on figure out that the word dikarnosa, that in many synagogues, when you hear that, the Hazan would not say it out loud. He would say, just look at it, we have Kavana because you have to say it, and then continue. Right? Yeah, because that's how we felt like it's a holy name. You cannot say it. In, in reality, it's actually, it's a word in based on Latin or Spanish, dia carnosa, the the day of the flesh. Like it's it's a, a very, most probably the name came uh, was inserted into the sidur, even with the verses by someone who was either a heretic or someone who was against Judaism and wanted to mock Judaism. So it says let let the Jews. Pray on on that holy day of Rosh Hashanah to and a name, and nobody knew nobody knew how it came in. Probably it started in one sidu and then caught on, and it's you know I've I've seen that in uh, even in this uh, um, now in in the new uh, new age of you know printing sidurim so easily. So you have. Uh, already, each, each synagogue has its, all its duim ready. I remember that when I when I was a when I was a kid growing up, someone brought into the synagogue a prayer from Moshe Shabbat that uh, originally was written in Yiddish by Rabbi Levi Hakov Berdichev, and it was only recited by Yiddish speaking uh, Jews in Europe. Then someone liked it and and brought it, and translated to Hebrew, so it was circulating around in the synagogues on. On little uh, cards. Ten years later, it was already printed in all of the Sephardic Sidurim. You know, so that that how it works. So all you need is one person who likes this tefillah and inscribes it at the at the, at the margin of his sidur. The next generation writes it into the sidur before the time of the printing press, and the next thing you know, it's printed. So bottom line, we say Mizmor twenty four. We say the psalm. We say the prayer, but we skip those three lines. With it says, in the uh, for the sake, in this it was on page eighty eight, for the sake of the holy name that comes of the mizmo, don't say that. You pray, you pray directly to Hashem. You don't need intermediaries in the form of names, uh, especially this name that has such a strange uh, history. Then on page three eleven in this sidu, uh, there's a three ten. There's a there's a prayer for uh, taking out the Sefer Torah. And it's one of the set of prayers. One is for Shanah, Kippur, also Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, and Shemini Atzer. There's tefillah for each, for each holiday. So the beginning of, the, uh, of that prayer is again in, in line with traditional prayers. May you have mercy on us. May your mercy override your anger. Uh, treat us with midat ha-hesed, midat ha-hamim, with loving kindness and, and compassion, and not with rigorous judgment. Um, but here, this is this is something that completely uh, does not make sense and does not belong to Rosh Hashanah. B'itchaber Torah shebichtav im Torah shebe'alpeh semolot tahat lerosha u'mashach gevurotav eleha. It says where when the oral law joins together with the written law, his left hand under her head based on Shira Shirim, and the, uh, the rigor of the, uh, the written law flows into the, uh, the oral law. This is for, yeah, time for you to to awaken your strength, God. And to go and fight against all the... Uh, the angels were trying to prosecute and bring us down. This whole imagery is, and even those who know Kabbalah, it doesn't belong in the language of Kabbalah. The idea of Torah Shebikhtav, Torah Shebikhtav, the oral law and the written law, even if there is such a concept, 
of looking at this the zivug as the holy union that is the cause of the Kabbalah, it does not belong on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, also, it says, Adam Rishonayim, just as uh, Adam, uh, the first man, was judged today and was acquitted, so uh, you should also acquit us. This is a concept that is not mentioned anywhere in the prayers. The uh, and the indication that this is uh, a prayer, a prayer that comes from the time of Shabbat Tzvi is that he says, let us correct and do what we have to do in this world. So, <coughs> no one will be rejected and go in exile. And that is a concept that the followers of Shabtai Tzvi promoted. The idea was that, you know, based on a Kabbalistic concept called the Nitzotzot, the sparks that were lost during the creation of the world. In Kabbalah, there is this concept of uh, that when God created the world, he, uh, he brought an abundance of light into the world, but the vessels called the Sefirot, the Sefirot were not ready to accept that abundance, and they broke. That's called Shvirat Kalim. So those vessels were broken, and the abundance flowed down to earth, and just like when a vessel breaks and, like, say, honey spills, you could... Uh, uh, recover some of it, but the rest will be lost. So there's a kind of, of those sparks of holiness that went down to the other side, to the dark side, called Sitraha or the Kali, Kalipot, shells, and that we, through our good deeds, we, we bring them up. So, that was understood as a symbolic act of that with our good deeds, we are constantly fixing the world, amending the world. Shabbat Tzvi came uh, with this concept that obviously was an excuse for a uh, promiscuous behavior. He said that in order for the righteous person to bring up those sparks that fell into the abyss, he has to go himself down into the abyss, into the darkness, and pull them out. How do you go down? By committing sins. So they promoted promiscuity uh, and sexual liberty and they lived together in the, in communes. It was a, a horrible, what horrible situation. Frame the 16th, 16th, 17th century. In India. In Turkey. In Turkey. Starting in Aza. Nothing good, I guess, comes out of Aza. And, uh, and spreading into Turkey. When, and then to the Ottoman Empire. Azan went up to Turkey? Yeah. He's Mirna. He's Mirna. No, he was Izmir, but, but his promoter, his manager was Natana Azati. Uh, there was a community in Aza at the time. Then... That is one, like I said, indication that is uh, this belongs to the school of Shabbat Tzvi. Also, it says, "Vetsena leyesha amecha, leyesha ait meshichecha, uvigvurot yesha eminecha." And go forth for the sake of the salvation of your nation and of your Mashiach. Mashiach is not a concept of Rosh Hashanah. Why do they bring it here? Because they believe that Shabbat Tzvi was the Mashiach. So, ideally, in the Beit Knesset, we skip those prayers. We say the traditional Barich Shemeh and the other Misha Barach, and that's it. So when Bana Tanya brings up the concept of the Kripot and the. Oh, yeah, definitely. Bar, why not? But, that, is that something that's related to Shabbat? No, not to Shabbat. Shabbat. The Kripot is, a, is, a, is a already. It's a yeah, it's, it's mentioned in Kabbalah, it's mentioned in the Zohar. Right. Yeah. But the idea of, uh, of soiling yourself in order to bring other up, like right, that, that, that is. Yeah. Now, there's a long prayer before Tkiyat Shofar um, that also is based on Kabbalah. We don't know exactly what is the source of the whole tefillah. Could be that some of it is from a legitimate source, but there's definitely an addition here that is not from a legitimate source. And I'll tell you which one it is. The idea of, of the prayer, this is only for the Tokea, but some people also read it, is that uh, the Tokea, the one who blows the Shofar, says... There are divine secrets that we don't understand in the in the blowing of the shofar, and I don't know how to uh, have the attention to to uh, tune in to those secrets. So I ask you to take my my sounds of the shofar and do with them as you wish. So uh, accept my sort of accept my prayer, even though I don't know uh, all the kavanah, which is a beautiful 
uh, concept. That's actually the concept of Slichot. The concept of Slichot, right. a very so common, now, right, very, very common in the Hasidut, where, you know, in Hasidic stories, you have the famous story of the kid who breaks into, like, who comes into the synagogue, and he doesn't know how to pray, he takes out the flute, and he, and he, and he like, he sounds this very sharp sound on the flute, and everybody wants to basically eat him alive, and he runs away, and the rabbi says, why are you upset? He, with his, uh, uh, pure intention. He just wanted to talk to God and he didn't know how to do it. The sound of his flute f- uh, cut through all your prayers that weren't able to ascend to heaven and he's the one who reached God. So that's a nice concept. But at the end, the the the, the, the Hazan or the Tokea has to read those uh, verses and say that there are names that come out of the, the their initials. El Nakarev Teshuat Metzapecha so several strange things. There are no verses like that. They're not biblical. So why create Rashi Tevot, like the acronyms to create the holy names? The the meaning of the words, again, has to do something maybe with Shabbat Tzvi. El nakarev teshuad metzapecha. Bring forth the salvations of those who look forward to you. Pachdecha sar totzimi maasar. Your reverence has moved away. Bring us out of prison. Why pachdecha sar? Or maybe the the terror of your punishment is away. Pedesh oim redeem the uh, the important ones. Pateh somim open the eyes of the of the blind who await your salvation. Delay yekushim vekabetz nefusim samochem muflagim. Uh, bring, bring forth those who are spread away, and uh, bring together those who are uh, uh, dispersed. So, like I said, the Hebrew is strange. The idea of the acronym is strange. But when you look at the acronym that come out of these words, this is where where it really becomes uh, strange. So, the first two sentences, the the acronym form the word enkatam. Enkatam is their uh, outcry or their wailing. It's good. Pastam, not a very uh, legal conjugation in Hebrew, but sounds like something that will end. So if you, we put those two acronyms together, and katam, pastam, their wailing will end. Beautiful. The next word is that is formed by the third verse is pashpasim. There's no meaning in Hebrew. And the fourth one forms the word Dionysim. Hmm. Which reminds me of? It's a Latin word, right? Latin word for? God. The God of wine. Dionysus. What? Dionysus. Like, was Bacchus in, in Greek and Dionysus in Latin. And just like we saw with Dikarnosa, hmm. here's the name of a pagan god that was put into our Sidu. There's no other explanation for that. I mean, when you, when you take into account... <clears throat> all the other oddities of the tefillah, you realize that we have a problem, and we have to, and we cannot just say, "Oh, but that's the practice we've been saying, saying it for years, so God is fine with that." No, if we know that something is wrong here, we should not say it. So, up until the v'chit kashu tishmau, when we quote verses from the Tanakh, fine, but this specific one should really be uh, uh, avoided. We should not say it. So, this is just a word of caution. Regarding the field in general, we must understand what we're saying. And if there's something that we don't understand, it's better to skip it. Not to say, oh, uh, yes, we have the concept of God understands what I'm saying no matter what. But if this is the concept, then try to say what you can and not just read from the Sidhu uh, words that uh, even the Hebrew speakers and even people who studied uh, in depth, the history of the text Acha cannot understand. So, very important to prepare before Rosh Hashanah to go over the prayers, to, to think what is the most important thing for me to say, to focus and concentrate. And there are there were great rabbis, among them Rabbi Avraham Yitzhak Kohen Cook, the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel. It was a, 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 a tremendous Amit Hacham, but also a man of passion and knowledge and, and high spirituality that on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, the only prayers he would say would be the Shema and the Amidah. That's it. Only Shema and Amidah. Really? Yeah. Um, oh, it just took him longer. 
but he would fo- he would just focus on these tefillot. He rather than saying all oh, other places these I und-. he knew well the words and understood well, and he would rather take time and just read those tefillot. <laughs>